Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. My house. I'm only a teenager, but I already had a few paranormal experiences. Perhaps you will not believe me, but I am sure that these things actually happened. First of all, I'll say that I have been interested in horror all my life. And when I was about nine years old, I had a lot of sleepless nights from ghost stories I'd read. When I was three, I hated dolls and had a model human skeleton named Little Skeleton because he was about a foot tall and substituted him as my doll. It was about this time that weird things started happening. Not much, of course, and not very often. The first thing always happened at night. What would happen was that first I wouldn't be able to feel my blankets. Then I would feel a hand on my back. The hand would gently stroke, scratch, and tickle my back. Even though the hand never hurt me, it terrified me. Whenever it did this, I never moved. I was too scared after all. I was only three. The hand continued to be with me until I was five, when I told one of my friends about it. After that, nothing happened for about a year. Then, when I was six, I was repeatedly scared because my closet door would always open, even when I closed it hard. This would not be so scary, but whenever it would open, a small green puff of smoke would float out. Now that freaked me. In the same year, my best friend saw a ghost behind me, and after we ran into my room and were talking, the door slammed hard. I knew that it wasn't a human because I was an only child and both of my parents were doing yard work. We ran out of the house and she went home. When I was seven, the volume dial on my tape player turned from louder to softer repeatedly. I had started to be afraid of my house. It was at this time that I started making concoctions from different fragrances and things around the house. Anyway, I had placed one batch of the stuff on a ledge by a window in my basement. I sat down on the couch and picked up the remote to turn on the TV when I noticed that I could hear strange music from the concoction and the sunlight was shining through it onto me. The music was really eerie so I moved away from the couch. The music stopped But when I sat back down, it started again. It sounded like no music from this world, and I have never heard any instrument with a sound like what I heard. I ran to my bedroom and calmed down. As I was walking towards my door, it slammed in my face again. I was afraid to touch it, but I opened it and ran to my mom. Nothing happened then until I was nine. I was doing some homework in the study And when I looked up for a second, Little Skeleton was turned so that he was looking at me. I put my head down, and when I looked back up, he was facing the other way. I was so freaked out. I ran and did the rest of my homework in my parents' room. When I was 10, I was home alone and heard some noises coming from the computer room. The computer was on, which wasn't too scary since my dad often forgot to turn it off. What was scary was that I had heard footsteps and voices from it also. When I looked in the room, no one was there. I told my parents when they got home, but they didn't believe me. Just a year ago, I was playing on the computer when I saw a small black something out of the corner of my eye. I saw it again many times after that and still see it. Only now it has grown and looks more like a shadowy person that darts behind something whenever I turn my head. Often now the door to the attic will close and open by itself. I have no idea what is going on. Is my house the center of a mass haunting? I hope not. I don't want to be afraid of my house forever. Elizabeth. 
While none of my experiences were all that intense, there are several things that I have seen and heard that are more than real. I was born in a tiny town not far outside of the New York border. The town grew up as a railroad mining town. Our house was built at the edge of town, the owner liking his privacy. While everyone in town took him to be a bachelor that spent most of his time at the rail yards, it became apparent when the old man died that he did have a son. The son moved in and raised a family there, also working on the rail yard. The family produced two sons. Tin types of the family were found in my bedroom closet when we remodeled. After this lineage, a daughter and son were born to one son and the other died. It was this son's daughter that greeted me not long after we moved into the house. It didn't help that she had died almost 30 years before I was born. Through the back door, across the old linoleum floor to the staircase in the room at the top, I lay snug in my little bed. I had been playing earlier that day and had left an old music box found in the room when we moved in, open on my dresser. My parents were downstairs enjoying their television when they heard me scream. I had rolled over, disturbed by something in my sleep that I couldn't quite explain and sat up. My music box, completely unwound when I'd gone to bed, was playing cheerily. But it wasn't that that had woken me. It was the figure of a girl standing next to my bed, gazing out my bedroom window into the backyard. My first thought were that she was lovely, long blonde hair and a pale blue dress, hands clasped behind her with a slightly sad air about her. It changed quickly, though, when she turned to look at me and instead of disappearing, advanced on me, hands outstretched, her face changing from benevolent to cruel in a heartbeat. My mother sprinted up the stairs with more energy than I've seen in her since, driving her away. But it would not be the last time I would see her, though after that each visit was absolutely benevolent. A few years later, we, the family and I, began remodeling the house tearing out walls and finding pieces of the house we had not counted on. Anyone who's ever remodeled the house understands that there are many strange things that can be found in a house's walls. Between the gross of finding a mouse corpse in one of my walls to find the remains of a burnt out old chimney on another, we also found a death certificate. For one, Elizabeth Grimney born July 17th, 1940, died March 22nd, 1952. The cause of death was so blurred with time and so undeterminable, but we finally had our ghost, Elizabeth. We've realized too that my music box was hers too, tied to it somehow. Since the remodeling though, I've not seen her and I have the sinking feeling that I won't again. Strange, I feel as though I've lost a friend. By my bedside. I lived in different houses several years ago and would also see a figure quite often standing at the foot of my bed or beside my bed. It was a tall man wearing a trench coat and hat. It did not scare me. I did not feel it was threatening. It had never appeared to me in any other home nor has it appeared to me in the one I currently live in. I would wake at night to see it, would wake my husband at that instant, and he would never be able to see the figure. It seemed to only appear to me. At the same time, our neighbors next door were having terrible haunting problems, which I won't even get into. It will make my story seem childlike. Several years ago, my husband and I went to see a bed and breakfast this was a huge house in southwestern Virginia. We did not hear of any of the home's histories when we arrived. We went to the bed that night and I woke in the middle of the night to see a young man kneeling beside the bed, fanning me with a magazine from a basket nearby. At first I thought it was my husband as it looked a lot like him. I stared at him for a few moments. Then, as I always did when I would see the other apparition, I just closed my eyes and hoped it would go away. The next morning, upon rising, I told my husband the story. He was not an avid believer in ghosts at this time, so he thought I was probably dreaming. 
We went down to breakfast. The owners of the home sat with us and he brought up my siding from the night before in a joking way. The wife suddenly appeared very interested and asked me what he looked like. I told her he had short hair, kind of cut like a crew cut blonde, muscular, wearing gym pants and a polo shirt. Her face turned white as she sat down and started to tell us about the previous occupants. Apparently the house used to room boys from the Naval Academy, if I remember correctly. Anyhow, one of the young men was found dead in a gym room upstairs. It was unclear whether it was an accident or whether he had committed suicide, but she said my description sounded as, as if it might have been him. My husband suddenly grew silent and stopped his joking. She then related that another guest who had stayed in the same room as we had reported that a man had wandered into his room that night, then wandered back out again. He assumed it had been another guest who had lost his way, but there were no other guests that night. Upon hearing about my sighting, she remembered his story and felt as if it might have been the same spirit. She said she would send me a picture of this young man if she could ever find it and just make sure if that was indeed who I had seen in the room. My cousin Robert. My cousin Robert bought a 200 year old colonial home in a small town in Massachusetts back in the 1960s. The house was in a semi-rural area with a bar next door. Robert was single and lived alone. One Saturday, when he was in the Army Reserves, he had taken a shower and had some time to spare before he had to leave to join his unit. He decided not to get dressed but to lie on his bed with a towel around his waist while he leafed through a magazine. His back was to the only entrance to the room. It was afternoon. He could see directly out the window in front of him. While he was reading, he heard a noise at the door. Since no one should have been in the house except for him, he tried to turn to see who was there. He found he couldn't move. Instead, he heard somebody walking across the room towards him. When the footsteps got to the bed, they stopped. The side of the bed then moved down as if someone had sat on it. He then felt a hand give a squeeze on his waist as if to reassure him. The hand remained there for a while. Even with a hand on him, Robert never felt afraid, but he was amazed by what was happening. He could see the second hand moving on the alarm clock next to the bed and the leaves blowing in the trees outside, which convinced him he wasn't dreaming. He still couldn't move. Not his head, not his body, nothing. He seemed to be frozen in space. After a while, the hand removed itself from his waist and the bed shifted back to its normal position like it would if whoever had been sitting there had gotten up. Robert heard the footsteps retrace their path to the doorway of the room. As soon as they got there, he could move. He flipped over to see the back of a girl with long brown hair that hung down to her waist, going out the door. Since his house was old, the stairway to the second floor was built in such a way that it was necessary to go up the stairs, take two immediate lefts, and follow the railing back the length of the house to get to his bedroom. In other words, it would have been impossible for anyone, even running, to go around to the head of the stairs and down them by the time he got to his bedroom door. Seeing nobody, he then decided to check all the other rooms in case somebody was hiding upstairs. He couldn't find anyone. My cousin Robert died about 11 years ago, but he told me the story shortly after it happened. He said it really didn't occur to him at the time that it could have been a ghost. He just couldn't figure out what was going on. In retrospect, the only thing which did spook him was the hand on his waist. Robert and I were very close. He kept me updated with the other unusual occurrences which happened in that house until he sold it. Robert was a talented artist who had money. There were many objects of value in his home, antiques and paintings especially, but small insignificant things kept being stolen. For instance, he had an antique candelabra with candles in it. He would frequently find one or several of the candles missing, but never all of them. 
he also would have cheap flashlights disappear. He even tested the ghosts by leaving the flashlights out in one of the ghosts' favorite places, the bottom of the stairs on the hand railing, to see if they would be gone the next day. At times, this did happen. I forget how many alarm clocks he had to replace. He never saw the ghost after that one Saturday, but since that experience, he was always aware he was not alone in the house. Eventually, he developed an affection for the ghost, and like I mentioned, started playing games with it by leaving the flashlights out to be taken. He was sorry he couldn't take her with him when he moved. My friend's story. It happened my freshman year, about five years ago now. I had a friend who lived on the same road as I, and we rode the same bus. We always sat together and talked since we didn't see each other to talk during school. This girl had many problems, mostly stemming from her family. She was often nervous and upset due to the many stresses in her life. One week, she seemed edgier than usual and started to tell me of things that were happening in her home. Her house wasn't previously haunted. Nothing unusual happened there until the things she told me. Her only idea was that it could have been a relative that had recently been killed and the circumstances of the death were hazy. She told of a malevolent presence that would breathe on her face while she tried to sleep and would come close to her while she bathed if she was alone. At one time, this thing attacked her kindergarten age brother while he was in a room playing video games. The thing yanked his shirt over his head and left scratches on his back. Needless to say, the kids, there were four of them, stayed out of that room. They took to sleeping in the living room together as they were scared to go into their own rooms. I'm sure more than this happened, but I don't remember much of the little I was told. Anyway, I became curious after a few days of hearing her tell me things and we decided to get together at her house after school that Friday. She wanted to use a Ouija board to find out what was in her house. Neither of us had one, but we made a makeshift out of a plain piece of paper and a ring. It worked pretty well most of the time. I don't know if that was bad or not, but I've been told it is. She wanted me in particular because for some reason, the thing always worked well if I touched it. Anyway, I went to her home that evening with a crude Ouija. It was pretty cold out, and unfortunately we had to use it outside due to the girl's parents, to whom nothing ever happened. This time it didn't work real well. We got almost no information. Fortunately, her parents left and we went inside. It was me, this girl, and her sister. We sat around talking a bit. They were obviously nervous. I, ever curious, asked if we could go into the game room where their brother had been attacked. They reluctantly agreed. They put me in front of them and stayed close behind me. This room's doors was just a curtain, so I pulled it back and went inside and didn't make it past the threshold. The room smelled putrid, like rotting flesh, and there was a definite feeling of something there, almost tangible. I felt pushed out of the doorway, as well as my friend. I was shocked and pretty frightened. We went quickly back to the living room and sat down close to each other, frightened. A little while later, I decided we should just listen to music or something. We did, and our fear went away, a little. Finally, we went back to one of the bedrooms to see if the presence had gone there, but there was no trace. When we went back into the game room, there was no longer any presence, but the smell was still in the air, as if whatever was there had left some sort of residue. My friend spent that night with me at my house. She was too frightened to stay in her own. However, the next time I asked her about her ghost, she said that some little things have happened, but for the most part, whatever it was, is now gone. The farmhouse. A couple of years ago, I lived in the bottom part of a two-family house. The house was originally once made for one family and was part of a farm. Behind it was the barn that was converted into an apartment. In the living room closet was part of the staircase that connected the two floors of the original house. 
behind the sheet rock was a small room that was boarded off by the living room closet on one side and my daughter's bedroom closet on the other. The room was visible through a hole in the sheet rock in the living room. The room was musty and had the petrified remains of several small rodents in it. The whole thing gave the impression of having been one big room that was divided into small rooms. From the very beginning, my daughter was afraid to sleep in her room. Before we moved into this house, she would sleep without a night light. When we moved in here, she had to have the light on and would only stay asleep in the room till I went to bed. Then she would come into my room. I thought this was just three-year-old sleep problems. Now I'm not so sure. We got a cat after we moved in and the cat got very strange. Occasionally, I would see a dark shadow in the kitchen across the room and if this happened when Cody, the cat, was in the kitchen, he would run from the room with his eyes and tail all bugged out and hide in my bedroom, which was at the opposite end of the house. Occasionally, I would lay in bed and be afraid to face the doorway because it felt as if I was being watched. The topper came on two separate occasions, both when my daughter was out of the house. The first time I was lying in bed, about to doze off, and I felt as if hands were pinning my shoulders to the bed. I remember trying to struggle but being unable to move. Suddenly, the pressure was gone and I could move. The second time was also in my bedroom. I was lying in bed when I felt like I was being dragged by my feet out of the bed. I tried to kick my feet free, but couldn't. When the feeling stopped, I was diagonally across the bed with both feet hanging off. At this point, I got angry and stood in the living room and announced that whatever was in the house could have it all day when I was home, but that when we were in it, I expected it to leave us alone. I didn't have the experiences again, but my friends who lived in the apartment in the barn had two experiences at this time. My girlfriend was in the kitchen and felt someone touch her back and no one was home at the time. Her husband was in the shower and felt someone grab him from behind. When he stuck his head out of the shower stall, no one was in the room with him and the door was locked from the inside. Shortly after this, I moved out. My friends have had no other occurrences, but I don't know if the new tenants in my house have had any. My first sighting. My first sighting was in my bedroom. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement to my left while laying in bed. My bed is on the west wall pointing east. The hall light shines through my door across my bed and onto the south wall. On that wall, I saw a shadow cast, but there was nothing between the light and the wall to cast a shadow. I got out of bed and tried to figure it out. I figured that whatever was the source of the shadow, apparently a small human figure, had to be standing at the southeast corner of my bed. I waved my hand through this area and felt nothing but an extreme cold. The air in that spot was at least 40 to 45 degrees colder than the rest of the room. It felt to be 20 or 25 degrees. I called my mother, who was downstairs watching TV at the time. I remained totally calm but felt not excited as such but very calmly excited. I can't come up with a word to explain the feeling. When my mother got to my room and turned the light on, before I thought to tell her not to do so, I ran over and shut the light off, but the shadow was gone along with the cold spot. I continued to have odd experiences in this house, but seemed to be the only one until my grandfather came to live with us. He had fallen in the stairs at his house and had injured his hand terribly. He needed constant care due to the injury and his age. He claimed to have a little boy that would come into his room and talk to him while he watched TV. He spent most of his time watching TV because he was in such poor physical condition. I should say his room was the living room. While he was with us, we built a wall between the living room and dining room, and the dining room became the living room. He described the little boy as short with blonde hair, the right size to fit the shadow. After he died in the kitchen of our house, more strange things happen. My grandfather used to always wash his hands in the downstairs bathroom before eating. One day we sat down to eat and the bathroom sink 
came on full blast with no one in the room. Jokingly, one of us said it was Père Père, or French for grandfather. My father jokingly shouted, Dad, knock it off. The sink immediately went off, and that was it. I've since seen the little boy myself. I never see him in the room, but I will see the reflection of him walking through a room in the windows, mostly in the dining room. Once I saw a reflection of him walk in front of the door that goes from the hall to the living room. I saw it in the TV screen. It walked down the hall and walked up the stairs. I was too surprised to turn around and see if I could see it this time, so I tried running upstairs to follow it, but never saw it. Last summer, the former owner's daughter came by to see the house, for nostalgia's sake, I guess. After walking through the house, she commented that my room used to be her room. Then she asked if I ever saw him. I asked who she meant. She said that she had numerous experiences with the ghost of a small boy in the house. I said yes and asked the nature of them. She told me about them and they all sounded just like the experiences I had. Other than my grandfather, we were the only two that ever saw him. The only connection between the two of us was that bedroom. She said that the kitchen used to be split in half and half was a laundry room. She said you could actually hear his voice in there saying things like, let me out, help, I'm stuck, and I can't get out. She also said that after they tore out the wall, she saw him through the whole house. Then we got on the subject of the basement. The basement is wide open with the stairs coming down in the southeast corner. When you turn, you can see the whole basement. Anyone, and I do mean anyone who goes down there at night with the lights out will come back up a lot faster. You get a feeling of dread that penetrates all through you. And as you run back up the stairs, you always feel like something is going to grab you by the ankles. Everyone we have tested this on comes back up with the same story. The closet door in the hall seems to have a mind of its own also. Sometimes when we try to close it, it keeps popping back open. You can keep your hand on the knob until you hear the pin thing fall into place, then let go and the door will pop open. Other items in the household do move around and there's times when things will disappear and lights turn on and off by themselves. And this happens pretty regularly. My father's ghost. I first felt a presence shortly after my father committed suicide in our second floor bathroom. I would often smell the scent of his cologne or feel a very cold icy breeze pass by me, especially when my mother and I would be sitting together in our kitchen. I never asked her if she had any experiences and for this, I am sorry. Several people who did not know where my father had died claimed to have seen him in our bathroom and it described the clothing he had worn on the day he died. The night before my mother passed away, she was lying in a hospital bed in our living room with my husband and my aunt and I by her side. She kept looking up the flight of stairs with her eyes very wide and tears streaming down her face. My aunt asked her if she saw her father or mother, and she said no. She asked her if she saw my father, and she said yes. My mother reached out her arms, the lights went out, the dog howled, and my mother lapsed into a deep coma and passed away early the next morning. Soon afterward, my husband saw my father and actually described him to me, although he had never seen a picture of him. Many nights, I thought my husband was getting into bed with me, I actually felt someone climb into the bed, but when I turned to kiss him, there was no one there. Other times, I would hear very heavy and slow footsteps. The door to our bedroom, which had actually been my parents' bedroom at one time, would open. A very icy cold breeze would brush past me, and someone or something would climb into bed. One night shortly after my mother's death, my father's college ring appeared on my bureau. I was certain that we had buried my father with this ring, and upon checking this with my brothers, were absolutely certain we had. I hid the ring in a drawer, but it constantly appeared on my dresser. 
I finally gave it to my oldest brother, and that is where the ring is today. We did not have any experiences for quite some time after that, but when we were trying to decide whether or not to move, we had many more experiences as though my father wanted me to leave. There was constantly noisy footsteps during the night, and he would appear at the foot of our bed, frightening my husband. Finally, we decided to move, and when I came to the house one last time, I had difficulty opening the door. It was not stuck, but actually was pushed as I was attempting to enter. When I left, the door was slammed shut behind me. One other thing that was odd, whenever I was in the house and feeling depressed, my childhood friend, who had lived next door to me for many years, would suddenly call and tell me that my father had contacted her through her dreams to tell her I was depressed and to make sure that I was okay and did not do as he did. This always gives me the chills. Marjorie. This story was told to me by my mother and in the retelling I will tell it in the first person as though she were telling it. It is also important to understand that my mother and everyone on her side of the family is deaf due to a genetic disposition. This is the story. I went to visit my cousins in Baltimore, Maryland. That night, as we went to sleep, my cousins, Marcia and Marjorie, left a small light on in the table in case I were to wake up and need anything. We needed the light so that we could see to talk. I swear, I had just laid down and I had even begun to get sleepy. I noticed my cousin Marjorie climbed down off the bunk, bed above me. She leaned over and began telling me in sign language to tell her parents that she loved them and not to worry about her. She said that she would miss them very much and that she hid the doll under the back porch. It was about that time that I noticed that Marjorie had no face and no hands. Yet I knew it was her, and I understood what she was saying. As I began to get scared, she just suddenly faded away. At the same time, something fell out of the bed above me, and I could feel it hit the floor. It was Marjorie. She had fallen out of bed and died, I learned later, of a cerebral hemorrhage. I tried to tell my aunt and uncle, but they were obviously distraught and kept telling me I was dreaming. Later, they would ask how I knew about the doll. Apparently, Marjorie had hidden her sister's doll somewhere and had refused to tell them where or even if she had taken it. They assumed that Marjorie must have told me. I swore she didn't, and she did not. I didn't know anything about the doll. I don't know if it was precognition or if she was dead and I saw her ghost. I guess I'll never know. But I do know that I saw something very strange that night. And that is the story as my mom told it to me. The stepson. I just recently married a wonderful lady who has a 10 year old boy from a previous marriage. And I love both of them very much. Also, I suspect that they are responsible for my unexplainable experiences, especially the boy. My wife has told me stories of a few instances that she has had. The most troubling occurred when she was a small child. One night, she awoke to the sound of a hideous voice. She rolled over to look at it and saw two red eyes in the dark. Those eyes told her they were going to get her. She swears to this day she was very awake. Another peculiar instance happened after she had had her boy, but years before she met me. She had made him breakfast and called him to the table. As he ate, she noticed him staring at the floor, his eyes following one or more things. He then cautiously raised his feet, put down his spoon, and held his legs to his chest. All the while, he never took his eyes off the floor. Of course, my wife saw nothing. My wife has told me that she has noticed black darting shadows out of the corner of her eyes off and on throughout her life. I have noticed this only once, about two weeks ago, around the end of June 1996. Her son moved in with us a few weeks before we were married, and not under the most pleasant of circumstances, unfortunately. We did our best to make him feel loved and welcome. 
While he adjusted quickly, you could tell he was troubled from time to time, and with his arrival came what I coined as our poltergeist. Nothing really scary, like threatening red eyes, just little happenings. In our room in the middle of the night, I've been awakened by our vertical blinds swaying and gently clacking on themselves. No fan or air conditioning was on, and only about three or four of them were moving. I recognize the identical movement when I walk by the blinds, which creates a breeze that moves them. Another day, my wife was just leaving for work. As she looked back at the apartment while walking to her car, several of the vertical blinds were swaying considerably and only on one end. Again, no fan, no open window, no air conditioning. Once I shut the door of our old microwave oven, it had been only slightly ajar like it hadn't been closed good. I shut it solidly, and to open it takes a bit of effort. It's old, but it works too well to replace it. We came back about two hours later, and the door was ajar again. I showed my wife this at the time, but to this date, it hasn't happened again. Apparently, the most dramatic occurrence took place when neither my wife or me was there. Our boy had come home from school and was in the apartment with friends. The friends were in the back bedrooms and our son was in the kitchen on the other end of the apartment. The friends said that the vertical in my and my wife's room violently began shaking. That scared them into our boy's room, where the horizontal blinds started shaking in the same way. That's when they said they heard noises coming from the walk-in closet. They all ran out of the apartment together, which happened to be about the same time I arrived home from work. They were still wound up like tops. They told me their breathless story, and when I went in, the only evidence I saw was that the horizontal blinds did look rather shaken. I know they're just kids, but I'm inclined to believe them. Things have quieted back down lately, knock on wood. However, we're about to move, so we'll see if that doesn't shake things up again.